New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays, transcribed with John Chapman. Best Plays, a series of hour-length dramas selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now John Chapman, drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Dennis King in St. Helena by R.C. Sheriff and Jean DeCasselis. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Our best play has several distinctions. For one thing, it is an excellent biographical drama, and the modern theater doesn't get many of these. For another, its co-author, R.C. Sheriff, is the man who wrote the unforgettable play of the First World War, Journey's End. But perhaps the chief distinction of St. Helena is the fact that it was rescued, literally rescued, by Sir Winston Churchill. None of London's commercial managers would risk a production of this story of Napoleon in exile, so it was put on at a rather obscure and out-of-the-way theater called the Old Vic. It languished for a week or so, and then Winston Churchill wrote a letter to the Times of London, saying that here was a fine drama that was being neglected by intelligent playgoers. His letter was enough to turn the tide. A failure at the Old Vic became a success in London's West End, and soon afterward it was brought to Broadway, where it shared best play honors with such works as High Tour, You Can't Take It With You, and The Women. Our Napoleon this evening is Dennis King. He is being brought by his British captors to Longwood House on the island of St. Helena. And already some of his staff have arrived there, including a loyal follower, Count Montolon. <laughs> In the southern waters of the Atlantic Ocean, reaching well within the tropic zone, is a small island of volcanic origin called St. Helena. In December of 1815, St. Helena was preparing to receive the most distinguished guest ever to arrive there, a guest destined never to leave, His Majesty the Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, now at the end of his brilliant career, held in detention by the British government. On the bleak rocky island, we were quartered on a small, modest estate called Longwood. Shockingly small and shockingly modest, as His Majesty's aides, General Gourgaud, General Bertrand, and I discovered the day we arrived. I tell you, it's a hovel. It's damp. I won't live in it. Then you can have the room overlooking the courtyard. It's been specially got ready for you, Gourgaud. That one reeks of horses. I thought you liked horses. Well, it's no good making things more difficult, Gourgaud. The room shelter has got a very good floor. It's not the floor. It's the smell I'm talking about. Well, sleep in a tent, then. We've all got to make the best of things for the time being. That's what I keep saying, but everybody's making the best of things at my expense. You've done no more than anybody else. I've... I... Who saved His Majesty from the Cossacks at Brienne? Oh, I have those to... Cossacks again. Yes. Oh, you can afford to be satisfied. You got here first and took the best room. I'm sure my wife will sleep in the tent if General Gorgo wants her room. Gentlemen, please, let's not quarrel. The Emperor may be here any moment. Meanwhile, we can arrange the table. When Madame Bertrand and I are dining, Madame will sit here and I will sit here. I'm to sit on the floor, I suppose. Now, you will sit here, Gorgo. Montalon knows I'm senior to him in the military household. Oh, nonsense. What? I'll instruct you where guests are to sit when necessary. Monsieur Las Casas will sit here. <laughs> You'll never keep Las Casas down that end. And you won't keep me from my rightful place. I ought to sit at the... Gentlemen, the Emperor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very well. Everything seems quite well arranged. It's not the Tuileries, but we'll manage. This cast? It seems very small, Your Majesty. Oh, it doesn't matter. I like small rooms. The Admiral has asked me to show Your Majesty plans for the new house. New house? Don't be absurd. It would take the English six months to build a new house. We shall all be back in Europe then. What shall I do with the plans then? Send them back. Send them back. Let's be on that window, Lescar. They've given you an excellent view of the harbor, Your Majesty. Who are those men? Out there against that fence. Oh, uh, sentries, Your Majesty. The Admiral has ordered the house to be surrounded at dusk by sentries at 40 paces interval. So the sentries are to surround the house at dusk, are they? 
I feel as though I'm watching savages from the South Sea Islands dancing around a prisoner they're about to devour. The Admiral's even got sentries on the goat paths in the mountains. He flatters me. When are we to see the last of that imbecile? The new governor, Sir Hudson Lowe, is reported to have sailed from England, Your Majesty. Well, let's hope he has a quick voyage. At least he's a soldier. This admiral's nothing but a shark. What's that, Bertrand? An invitation to dine with the admiral at Plantation House tomorrow night, sir. Who's it for? For Your Majesty. Let me see. Admiral Sir George Coburn requests the pleasure of General Bonaparte. General Bonaparte. Send this card to General Bonaparte. The last news I had of him dates from the battlefields of the pyramids. In the future, bring me no communication unless it is properly addressed to the Emperor. We retired early that first night at Longwood and would have slept well into the morning of the following day had we not known that the Emperor would expect each of us to report to him early in the day. He started the morning in conference with Cipriani, his servant and friend who had been with him since Elba. Where does the water come from here, Cipriani? It's brought in pipes from Jamestown, Your Majesty. It's much too hard for shaming. We must arrange to have rainwater collected. Very good, sir. See who that is, Cipriani. General Gurgo, sir. Ah, Gurgo. Come in, come in. You may go, Cipriani. Good morning, sir. What's the matter, Gurgo? Nothing, Your Majesty. You look sad. I've reason to be. I slept badly. Well, we'll find you a little wife. That's what you need. A nice little wife. And in the meantime, it's not easy to lead this monastic existence, sir. It's not to be wondered at that I'm ill and out of sorts. I should be happy if you still needed me to work on your memoirs. Would you dictate to Las Cas now? Las Cas receives every favor. Las Cas is always with you. Gurgo. I want Las Cas to be your friend. He's too much of a hypocrite for me. Oh, your Majesty must forgive me, but those are my feelings. I am not interested in your feelings. I don't read hearts. I hear words, that's all. You can look cheerful no matter how you feel. Don't you think that sometimes when I wake up in the night, I have my bad moments too? When I think of what I was and what I am now... Soldier must have a soul of marble, Gurgo. I could listen to the news of the death of my wife or my son without a change of feature. Later, the feelings of the man burst forth. But only when I am alone with myself. Your Majesty knows I would blow my brains out for you. All right, all right. I'll keep that in mind. In the meantime, I want you all to live as a family. Now, happily. Oh, come in, Montalon. Come in. Oh, how's your wife this morning? Worried, sir. The little girl seems feverish. Teeth, that's all it is. Teeth, I told her so last night. Ah, there are the horses now. Now, gentlemen, this morning we... We take the road to Hut's Gate, then the mountain road round the punch bowl. We can plan a different ride for each day of the week. Your Majesty, I should tell you, we will not be riding alone. Why not? Instructions from the Admiral reached Count Bertrand last night. An English officer is to accompany Your Majesty when he goes riding outside the Longwood boundaries. So that's the latest insult. Very well. We shall remain indoors. But, sir... Send I... the horses back! Let the Englishman follow his own shadow! We remain indoors. Yes, sir. Well, they're determined to force on me a martyr's crown of thorns. Let them do it. Well, Montalon, if we can't ride, we can read and write. There's plenty to do indoors. A memoir. The battle. We'll spend our time like this. From nine till twelve, we'll read and work at our English. From four till eight, we'll work on the campaigns of 1812... 13.40. 8 till 10, dinner and conversation. 10 till midnight, we'll spend in the library. Yes, Montalon, we must 
will you organize our life? Now it is April of 1816. It is nearly two in the afternoon. Lunch is over, and the party is gathered in the library taking coffee. Well, when are we going to see Madame Bertrand again? Uh, not for some little while, Your Majesty. <laughs> I, I don't know what's the matter with you modern women. Madame Montalon, would you believe that my mother was running about on the Corsican hills a few days before I was born? Your mother had seven children, sir. It had become second habit. When, when are you going to follow Madame Bertrand's example? Every household should have six children. Six, sir? Yes. You've got to allow for, say, three to die and three to live. That's two to replace the father and mother. <laughs> and one reserved for accident. Well, our guests are arriving. I'm almost looking forward to see this new governor. I never want to see the admiral again. He's done everything in his power to humiliate us. Bertrand. You'll meet him at the door. I'll receive him in the study. May I present the new governor, Sir Hudson Lowe and Admiral George Coburn. General Marquis de Montalon. Your Excellency. Madame Montalon. Your Excellency. Madame. A Comte de Las Cas. Your Excellency. General Baron Gouraud. I've advised the Emperor that you are waiting upon him. Did Your Excellency enjoy a good voyage? Slow, I'm afraid. We had good weather, but only a slight wind. We were 66 days at sea. We were 64. We had the advantage of you, Sir Hudson. You find all long voyages average very close to the same number of days. You make it up here and you lose it there, you know. Really? Are you a good sailor, Sir Hudson? Uh, fairly, madame. Quite fairly. You are lucky to live in this high position. You've got beautiful views all around. That's just the trouble. If only we had a few trees. There's no shade up here, and the wind comes across the plain with nothing to break it. Will you come this way, Sir Hudson? Eh? And I, sir? I was instructed to announce only the governor. Uh, this way, Your Excellency. Ah, you've given me happy memories to take back to England, gentlemen. You've made them for yourself, Admiral. I'm told that General Bonaparte intends to destroy my reputation and ruin my career. If the Emperor gives a coin to a native, you think the peace of Europe is being disturbed. You continually abuse me for withholding from General Bonaparte the title of Emperor. My government never acknowledged that title. The Emperor is not the prisoner of your government. He's not your prisoner at all. Sir George, my business is quite finished here. Let us go. With pleasure, sir. Good afternoon, madame. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Did you see how annoyed he looked? He's even worse than the admiral. I wonder what happened in there. I wonder... If... Well, my friends, I suppose you heard the news. No, we've heard no news, Your Majesty. You're to be put onto a boat and taken in custody to the Cape. Oh, to the Cape? Oh, oh, unless you sign a declaration that you will remain with me here forever. Oh, Dr. O'Mara, come in, come in. Have you brought me any news? No, sir. I've heard nothing. Nothing at all? No news of the Empress or my son? No, sir. But there is a ship in the harbor. Yes, I saw it come in this morning. There, there may be news waiting for us there. It may be waiting to take friends away. I was with the governor when those declarations came back unsigned. He looked black as thunder. Did you read the form of the declaration he wanted them to sign? I heard, of course. Worded to trick them into repudiating my title. I forbade them to sign without adding the word emperor. He must take it in that form or not at all. But it's only a word. It's a word. That means everything. 
I was chosen emperor by the French nation and consecrated by the Pope. Tell that to your governor. Tell him, too, that I'm suffering from scurvy and my, my legs are swollen. Look, feel that. Yes. Yes, there is a slight inflammation. Of course there is. Have you got any pictures of the anatomy? I'd like to study them. I wouldn't, sir. The pictures show you organs of the anatomy you never knew about. You feel for them in the body, and they at once begin to ache. <laughs> you're, you're a good fellow, O'Mara. Oh, if only the rest of these English were like you. I am an Irishman, sir. Well, that's the same thing. Uh, far from it, sir. Hmm? Uh, you may be right. English are a curious race, a, a savage race. They fear death less than we do. They often kill themselves. But that, that of course, is due to their damp climate. No, O'Mara, I shall not hasten my end by one minute. It's not that I fear death, you understand. In time of war, I've seen so many people pass rapidly from life to death that I've become familiar with it. Matter, matter, it's all matter. As a doctor, you know that. All except the soul, sir. The soul? Well, the soul is only matter. Then where do you fit in God, sir? I am inclined not to fit him in. I can't say I agree, sir. I think everything is the work of God. Come in. Your Majesty. What is it, Bertrand? Your Majesty... The governor has given us two hours to sign the declaration in the form laid down. He refuses to accept it with the word emperor inserted. If it is not signed and returned by midnight, we are to be placed on a ship tomorrow morning and taken to the Cape of Good Hope. Gather the others in the library. I'll join you immediately. <laughs> Well, my friends, it seems that this is to be our last evening together. There's a ship in harbor to take you all to the Cape, unless you sign those forms by midnight. Know, we, we can't sign you. Are we to tell the world that we no longer call you emperor? We can't do that, sir. Well, I'll sign anything rather than dishonor myself by deserting my emperor. I've been at your majesty's side for six years. I followed you in your victory. Yes, Gurgu, I know, but I refuse to allow any of you to bind yourselves to my fate. You order me not to sign unless that form includes the title word of emperor. I shall sign because you are more to me than that. The word emperor may not be written on that paper, but it's written in my heart. Give me that paper, Bertrand. What do the rest of you say? Since it's the only way to stay, yes. I'll sign too. Yes, Very I'll well, sign. my friends, but when you deliver it to the governor, inform him that he was signed against my orders. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. They'll stay. They'll stay. For a time then, the emperor was pleased with his loyal little court. But the morning came in November of 1817 that our little group was diminished by one. It was a fitting time for tragedy, a gray, wet, cheerless, and grim day. In the dining room at Longwood, I was working over the accounts, a task I despised, while Gourgo paced restlessly the length of the room. He's been shut up in there with Las Casas for two hours and twenty minutes. I made use of and thrown aside like a bit of cast-off clothing. Well, the emperor's like that. Hmm. The more I see of emperors, the more I think of republics. Now, oh, these eternal frogs will drive me mad. It's the rain that brings them up. The rain. The rain. The Paris. The shops, the lights. Do we ever see them again? Oh, Dr. O'Mara. How is the emperor this morning? He's suffering from his liver, his legs, and his teeth. Any news this morning, Doctor? There's a pile of letters for you. Came in on the Newcastle. Also a box of books for the Emperor. And the case with the bust of the Emperor's son. Have they made up their minds to let him have it yet? Between ourselves, I hear they wanted to break it up. To see if there were any secret letters in it. Well, why wait a fortnight and keep the Emperor in suspense? They are frightened out of their wits about this rumor of smuggling him off the island in a dirty linen basket. Is he disengaged? 
Of course not. Las Cas is with him. He's never out of the Emperor's room nowadays. He's just here to get copy for his book. He sucks the Emperor dry with his eternal questions. Nothing left for you, eh? Good morning, gentlemen. Well, Monsieur Las Cas. Plenty of stuff for the book this morning. Magnificent. A completely new account of Waterloo. <laughs> Congratulations. I happen also to have a very good account of Waterloo. Oh, out of date. The Emperor has given me a completely new version. He never told you why he attacked the center and discarded his idea of turning the enemy's right wing? I hope I shall never sink to selling the words my Emperor has said in French. <laughs> uh, uh, did, uh, did he say if that tooth is still paining him? Yes, yes, yes. He wants it out. He will call you. I hope we have less trouble than we had with... Uh, with this tooth. <laughs> I had to sit him on the floor to get this one out. I wonder what it would fetch in a London auction room. Oh, 15 pounds at least, I should say. Oh, did he give you that? Of course. Uh, um, uh, uh, could you manage to get one for me? O'Mara, you promised me the next tooth. I promised nothing of the sort. It's a horrible suggestion. I certainly shan't sell it in a London auction room. You'd get more for it in Paris. Let me have that one. You can keep the one you get this morning. I think not. Give the me the tooth. Will you have no doctor. right to it anyway. The emperor will see the doctor. Excuse me, gentlemen. The, the emperor will see the doctor. My patient is waiting. Omar is not to be trusted. He tells the governor every word he hears. The emperor sets too much faith by Omar. He also repeats every word the governor says. The emperor knows whom he can trust and whom he cannot. Oh? I'm not so sure of that. What was it you reckoned your diary would bring you, Lascars? A uh, hundred thousand francs? <clears throat> I've no idea, General Gorgo, what financial value may be attached to my book. But I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say it is a work that will go down to history as the basis of all future biographies. Good morning, Monsieur Lascars. I would like a word with you. Well, Captain Nichols. You have a servant, James Scott. I do. He is being detained by the governor for trying to smuggle a secret letter of complaint to Europe. You know that orders decree that all correspondence for Europe shall pass through the governor? I do. Yes, but uh, in this particular instance... Monsieur Lascars, in the name of the governor of St. Helena, I arrest you. What? Oh, oh look here. Uh, now, uh, what does this mean exactly? It means that you'll be transported to Europe. Oh, but my books, my diaries, uh, they're my private property. I must have those. Your property will be respected. <sighs> uh, but to avoid the circulation of mischievous reports in Europe, uh, the governor orders that your journals must be confiscated. You can't take my books. They're mine. I am sorry, monsieur. Uh, then I won't go either. You can't... You Guards! Can't take... take him! Come along! Come along. No, you can't! It's, it's scandalous! Those books are worth a fortune. You just take him. let me have them. Move along. Go to go. You have no right to take him along, guards. No. No. Move along. Get the emperor. Help me. Oh, take care of my notebooks. Get it done. Then everything has to my diary. Come on. Don't let him. Oh, what? What is it? Oh, what? What is it? My scars. Arrested. Good Lord. Why? He was smuggling papers through to Europe. What will the emperor do? Who's going to tell him? No one will need to tell him. He knows. He looked through the window and saw him being carried off. He saw? Why doesn't he do something? What could he do, madame? After Lascars was deported from St. Helena, the emperor began dictating his memoirs to Gogo who fretted as much about the increased demands made on his time as he had complained in the past about how little work he was given. A few weeks after Lascars was sent away, Gogo and the Emperor were at work on the terrace while waiting for the statue of His Majesty's son to be delivered. Gorgo, what can be keeping Cipriani? He should be here with a bus by now. He's on his way from Bertrand's house with it now, sir. Bertrand? Why must that man always take the virginity out of my news? Well, shall we go on with the dictation, sir? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come, come to work. Now, where have we got to? Um, if I am accused of despotism, they can claim that dictatorship was necessary in the circumstances. I closed up the chasm of anarchy. I cleansed the revolution from the filth that had accumulated. I stabilized thrones. Did, did I say that? Yes, sir. Hmm. It verges on the mountebank. 
That isn't how I put it in the notes I made during the night, is it? Well, no. Uh... Oh, can't you read it? Not very well, sir. Well, why can everybody read my writing except you? It's quite clear. Oh, well, let it. Let it stand as it is for the moment. Oh, my fame won't rest on my 40 victorious battles, Gurago. Waterloo will wipe out the memory of all those victories. Oh, never, sir. Yes. The last act makes one forget the first. But what will never pass away is my book of laws, my code, the harbors of Antwerp and Flushing. Put that down. With room for the largest fleets in the world, the Port of Venice, the revival of the weaving mills of Lyon, the water supply of Paris, the Louvre, the setting up of new industries, those are the monuments that will defy calumny. Yet when I close my eyes, all my mistakes parade before me like figures in a nightmare. With 20,000 men less, I ought to have won at Waterloo. Ah, Cipriani. The burst is still case, sir. I'll take it out back and open it there. No, 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 no. Place it on that chair. Now, carefully, carefully. That's right. No, no, no. Get me a chisel and a hammer. Come on, quickly, quickly. At once, your mate. It arrived three weeks ago. For three weeks, the governor's kept me in suspense deliberately, telling everybody on the island he was going to smash it. Only because he thought there was a message hidden in it. To do him justice, I don't think he really If I would... said the governor was a good man, you would say he was a bad one, Gurgo. If I remarked that the sun was shining, you would say it was dark. Yes, my great fault is... That you always say what you think. Now, where's that hammer and chisel? Here they are, sir. Shall I open it? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll open it. Hold this end of the box. Who's out there? Governor, sir, he's with Bertrand. How dare that man raise his voice near me? Ah, your Majesty, I, I, I beg your pardon. The Governor, sir, he asked for an urgent interview with you. I don't want to see him. You know that perfectly well. I'm sorry, General, but the conduct of Count Bertrand makes it necessary for me to see you. Well, Governor. Instructions have come from my government concerning the expenses of your establishment. I wanted to discuss this with you personally so that I could make agreeable arrangements. I've come here on four occasions, and each time Count Bertrand has informed me that you were in your bath. I had one directly. I heard you were coming. The expenses of this house in 12 months reached 17,000 pounds. The impossible figure. My government has fixed the allowance at 8,000 pounds. On my own responsibility, I'm prepared to raise this. Providing... Discuss these details with my cook. I must discuss them with you if I am to do anything to make your situation more agreeable. We've had nothing but trivial, humiliating annoyances since you arrived here. I didn't come here to be insulted. It's your policy to get false stories back to Europe. But my government is fully aware of your schemes and will attach no importance to them whatever. Good morning. Bertrand. Bertrand, never let me see that man again, you hear? He brings out the very worst in me. He makes me say and do things I'm ashamed of. I never would have permitted myself such a scene in France. Never. I'm sorry, sir. He took me by surprise. Oh. Very well. Now open the case, Cipriani, and let's forget that man. Oh, no, look. Careful, careful. Here. Hold all this rubbish, Gurgo. Now lift that board out of the way. No, no, no. I, I, I will lift it out. Ah, he's very much like you, sir. No. He's like his mother. Look at that face. A man would have to be a monster to harm a face like that. If Lowe had destroyed it, I would have raised such a storm that every mother in England would have execrated his name. But, sir, he did not destroy it. To have a son like that and not be able to see him, guide him. Caged up in Vienna like an animal. And to think I spared that city three times. 
Ich kann nicht. In a moment, Act Two of St. Helena, starring Dennis King. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Now, Act Two of the Best Plays production of St. Helena, starring Dennis King. Of all of us in our little party, Gogo seemed to suffer most from the confinement and lack of activity. Often I had to exercise the most extreme restraint to prevent violence flaring up between him and myself, with whom he had replaced Las Cas as the source of his imagined persecution. It was after the New Year's Eve party in 1817 that the Emperor spoke to him. Gurgo, what is this nonsense about a duel between you and Montalon? There has been no duel, yes. How are we to live together unless we forget our trivial quarrel? Oh, it's no use. Your Majesty knows how wretched I am. I'm not well, either. I've had a pain in my stomach for days. Oh, that's nothing. I've got a pain in my stomach, too. Have a cold rub down. It'll do you good. Is everything all right with Montalon now? No, sir. And it never will be. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Now, come and sit down. Nothing interrupts a tragic scene more effectively than sitting down. <laughs> Your Majesty always laughs at me. Only when you behave like a child. You knew when you followed me here the things you'd have to face. I knew the hardships, but I can't face them without Your Majesty's friendship. But that's not enough for you. You want more than that. You want to be my familiar, my equal. No, Your I Majesty. I accept I'll... that from nobody. You've made my life a burden here with your continual jealousy. You hated Las Cass because I found pleasure in his conversation. You hate Omar because, as my doctor, I allow him into my room. You hate Bertrand. Now you hate Montalon. I hate his wife more than I hate him. Oh, why? Because she has stolen the regard you had for me. Because... Oh, of... be quiet. That's enough. What a child you are. Do you expect me to send you love letters? No. Come on, good go. You've got lots to be thankful for. You're young. The whole life's ahead of you. Time is passing, sir. I'm 35. I see Bertrand surrounded by his family. I see Montalon, my own age, with a wife and son. What have I got? For three weeks now, Your Majesty's never even sent for me. At dinner, you ignore me. Because if I sent for you, you do nothing but argue and contradict me. Because I'm the only one of all your staff. I know, the only one who's frank and honest. Why is it that the others can always think of something pleasant to say? Because they say the rest behind your back. What do I care what people say behind my back? I defy any man to deceive me. He can never be as bad as I imagine him. I sacrificed everything to follow you. And yet, you suggest to Bertrand that if I were to commit suicide, it would arouse sympathy in Europe. Are you mad, sir? Well, it's the truth. My dead body is all that would be of any value. It's of no value, living or dead. You're afraid of this life because you're a coward. And cowards are of no use to me. By God, then I'll go. Yes, go. I owe you nothing for following me here. If you'd stayed in France, you'd have been hanged. Sometimes I think it would be best if you all went, the whole lot of you. Oh, you're a wretched lot. So many... Funeral mute, sir. Oh, I'll stay here alone. I... <laughs> Good Gurgo, Majesty. Gurgo, I... write me a letter saying that you're ill. I will endorse it and <sighs> send it to the governor. I shall miss you, Gurgo, but you're right. It's useless for you to stay. We shall meet again in another world. Goodbye, Gurgo. Leave me now. <sighs> Accept my farewell, sir. And my wishes for your happiness. When thinking of me, sometimes may your majesty say... He at least had a good heart. The longer our stay on St. Helena lasted, the less we seemed to have the confidence of our British custodians... After a rumor was circulated that the emperor was seeking an escape from the island, 
we received almost daily visits from the governor or his officers trying to determine that the emperor was still present. Finally, the point was reached where we seldom even received them when they called. Yes, sir? Would you advise General Bonaparte that Governor Lowe and Captain Nichols are here and that I wish to see him? I have important communications to make to him. The Emperor's had a bad night. It is at present in his bath. He orders me to tell all callers that the dead do not receive visitors. Nonsense. If he's so ill, why did he refuse to see Dr. Verving? The Emperor declines to see any but Dr. O'Mara. Dr. O'Mara's duties with General Bonaparte are at an end. He sails for England tomorrow. I wish to see the general to explain the nature of some orders I've received. The emperor's in his bath. We will wait. The emperor will be in his bath for two or three hours. Come on, Nichols. I'm sick of this farce. You will return every half hour until you can report that you've seen General Bonaparte. If he hasn't been seen by this time tomorrow, I shall take other measures. Gone? Yes, but he's furious. Excellent. It will increase his blood pressure. What? Back already? Shall I answer it, sir? Yes, you disposed of him nicely before. Go ahead. Oh, Dr. O'Mara. Hello, O'Mara. You've just missed Hudson Lowe. We've had another of his charming visits. I know. I saw him leaving. How is the Emperor Cipriani? The Emperor suffered a lot with the pain in his side last night. We missed you, sir. What's he been doing for it? Nothing. He won't see Dr. Burling. He's gone back to fasting. Well, I must say goodbye, Doctor. It'll be dark in a minute. I must light the Emperor's lamps and let him know the coast is clear. Goodbye, Cipriani. So, he won't see Dr. Berling. No, he won't see any English doctor unless he's attached to him under his own conditions, as you were. Uh, some Corsican doctor is being sent out by his mother, but he can't be here for months. C can't you possibly stay for a bit? Surely the governor won't object The governor to... won't let me stay on this island another day. But you've done nothing wrong. That's not his opinion. If I don't report every word I hear in the Emperor's rooms, the Governor considers I'm taking the Emperor's side against him. He's practically told me I was a spy. Romara, is the Emperor really ill? How do you mean, really ill? Well, I mean it's... It's difficult to know if he really is. There is no doubt he's got an affliction of the liver. Serious? It might be, without constant care. You're not looking too well yourself, Montalon. Ah, uh, this constant pain in the chest. I, I can't stand this life any longer. Nor can my wife. But how can we possibly ask to go when the Bertrands worry him every day to let them go, too? Well, somebody's got to stay. I hear a priest is coming out with his, the, the Corsican doctor. Yes, yes. Perhaps when the priest and the doctor arrive, we may be allowed to go, too. It's four years now since we've seen our two eldest children. Well, it's getting dark. I must hurry. Convey my respects to your wife. We sail at dawn. Lucky man. Come, I'll announce you to the Emperor. It was not until September of the following year that the priest and the doctor sent by the Emperor's mother arrived on St. Helena. General Bertrand went to the boat to meet them, and the Emperor waited in the little bedroom, which he very seldom left now. Our guests have arrived, sir. They're waiting. The doctor understands that no reports on my health are to be shown the governor until they've been passed by me. I've made it quite clear to him, sir. You are positive the English had no part in the choice? Quite, sir. They sanctioned it, that's all. All right. I'll see them now. The priest first. Come in, father. Come in. The Abbe Vignali. Your Majesty... What's your name? Angel Paul Vignali, Your Majesty. Angel Paul. Well, you're a native of Marsalia, I'm told. Yes, Your Majesty. And you studied medicine too? Where? At, at, at Rome, Your Majesty. Have you actually practiced medicine? No, Your Majesty. Ah, you haven't. You understand your services will be entirely ecclesiastical. You will not try your medical skill on anybody here. No, Your Majesty. Tell me, did you uh, did you see anyone of importance when you passed through London? Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't think so. You don't think so? I see. Are your parents alive? 
Yes, Your Majesty. Well, didn't you mind leaving them to come out all this way? Uh, yes. No, 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 Your Majesty. Why did you come here? I... You probably don't know. No. Well, you won't find life easy here. We must all try and make the best of each other. You may go now. We'll meet at Mass tomorrow. Uh, uh, yes, Your Majesty. Oh, Bertrand. Is the doctor any better, or is he stupid, too? Well, sir, he's different. Show him in, show him in. Let's get it over. Uh, will you come in, doctor? Dr. Antomaki. So this is Dr. Antomarki, eh? Come in, doctor. Let me have a look at you. Your Majesty, stand where I can see you by the light. You are a Corsican. A brigand of a doctor, eh? <laughs> yes, Your Majesty. When were you last in Corsica? Two years ago, sir. How old are you? About 30. About 30. Don't you know your age? <laughs> 30, Your Majesty. You studied medicine at Pisa? I commenced my studies at Leghorn, then Pisa. I was received as doctor in medicine and philosophy at the University of Pisa, March 1808. I afterwards went to Florence, where I applied myself to anatomical researches and was oh, yes, appointed... yes, 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 we all know that. We've read your history. What made you forsake your employment to share my exile on this rock? Neither gold nor favors, Your Majesty. I have set no price on my services. I have stipulated no... Yes, yes, yes. Now answer my question simply. It was proposed to me, Your Majesty. Ah. I desire no reward... I just accepted the honor. You before. might not have suited me. I might have sent you back. What then? <laughs> well, neither I... my mother nor Cardinal Fesch had written to me informing me of your departure. I warn you, I distrusted every individual of your expedition until... That accounts for the Marshal's daily cross-examinations. I admit, I, I... I am talking, sir. Your Majesty, I beg your pardon. You know that I am not sympathetic towards doctors. What good is a doctor to a starving man when all he needs is a loaf of bread? Exercise is what I needed. The English made that impossible for me. It's resulted in the chronic affection of the liver and of the heart. Will you allow me to take your pulse, sir? No, 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 later. Besides, my pulse wouldn't tell you anything. I've never heard of my own heart beating. I've often wondered if I had one. There are other ways of getting the exercise your majesty needs. Would you have me turn somersaults in my bedroom? <laughs> no, sir. But there are games, exercises. My father added years to his life by digging up his lions every morning. Yes, that's, that's an idea. We might start digging our graves. That'll be all for the present. You'll need philosophy and resignation to live here, Doctor. You're too young to have either. I think Your Majesty will find... You may go. Your Majesty. Well, Bertrand, these are the men we've been waiting for all these months. A sorry lot, eh? Was I rough with him, the, the doctor? I think you were very patient, sir, considering. A charming pair. A cretin and a lout. And these are the men who have come to take the place of Lascaz, O'Mara, even poor Gurgo. Oh, we didn't realize how fortunate we were. Well, misfortune has its good side. It teaches us the truth. Resignation. That is the dominion of reason. The real triumph of the soul. It is indeed, sir. He, uh, recommends exercises. He suggests we dig the earth. I, I don't think it would suit me, sir. I, I wonder, could one, uh, could one make... Some sort of garden here. Oh, I doubt it, sir. Look at the trouble my wife had with these miserable little shrubs. Yes, but she did grow a few shrubs. We might do the same, more. No, 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 why not? We could have a lawn down there in front of the windows. An avenue up to the porch. Do you see what I mean? Come here to the window. Now, look. There, you see. And then perhaps an orchard down there. An orchard? Well, why not? An orchard down there, a fountain in that corner, a vegetable garden round there. We might even 
grow oranges. We did not grow oranges, but we did receive from Corsica some slips of orange trees. These we transplanted almost daily each time the emperor found a more choice spot. For a while, the garden occupied our time, and at the emperor's insistence, we would take up our duties as gardeners each morning at 6.30. Cipriani was usually the only one of us to arrive on time. Cipriani! Now, where is everybody? I'm sorry, sir. I had no idea your majesty had written. It's half past six. Where are they all? My watch says only a quarter past. Well, it's slow then. They must have heard the bell. We're waiting the better part of the day. Look here. Look at that. What's wrong, sir? Wrong? Can't you see? The seeds I set yesterday all scratched up again. I told Navarres that if he let those chickens of his out again, I'd... Get my gun, Cipriani. Yes, Your Majesty. Oh, and my spade, too. Yes, Your Majesty. Good morning, Your Majesty. Come along, Burton, come along. Now, where's your wife? Uh, in bed, Your Majesty. Her back's too stiff to let her move. I'm afraid she overdid it yesterday. That rake's too heavy for us, sir. Ah, Montalon. Now, you're late. I came to ask if you would excuse me this morning, sir. I, I ought to stay indoors. I've got a temperature again. I got very hot lifting that turf yesterday, and... Well, then the wetting you gave me with the hose pipe, sir. Oh, nonsense, sir. Good perspiration's all you need. Look here, it's disgraceful. My seed, I spent an hour setting them. And then the Vera's chicken scratched them up again. Here's your gun, sir. Ah, thank you, Cipriani. Now then, I want everybody. Come on, gather around. Come here. Now, I thought of a new plan in the night. I want to reorganize the whole garden. Those fruit trees are too exposed down there. We'll have them up and plant them around my bedroom window. But we only moved them yesterday, sir. They'd be moved twice in a week, and, the, and there's fruit on them. I know what I'm doing. You can move peach trees any time. Now, Cipriani, you're good at digging. You make the holes. In the lawn, sir? No, 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 no. We'll have the lawn over there instead. It's a much better place for it. Montalon, Bertrand, can move the turf. We'll break for half an hour at nine o'clock for a cup of coffee. Digging's the... Finest exercise in the world after riding. Ah, don't you feel better for it, Bertrand? Uh, much, much better, sir. Here they come. Three of them. Who, oh, sir? Chicken. Hey there, Montalon. Stand away there. Now look out. <laughs> That'll teach them to scratch my seed. Not a bad shot, eh, Bertrand? What shall we do with the chickens, Your Majesty? Have them for dinner. Very good, sir. <laughs> uh, Petro, Petro, here, give, give me your hand. Oh, what is it, sir? Nothing. It, it will pass a, a momentary faintness. Oh, sit, sit here, sir. Yes, yes, that, that'll do. Are you all right, sir? It's, it, it, it's, it's nothing. Do you remember the goldfish at Melmaison, Bertrand? Oh, I do, sir. We might have a pond and some goldfish here. I'll make inquiries in Jamestown, sir. Listen. I didn't hear anything, sir. I thought I heard the sound of a bell. A bell? No, sir, I didn't hear it. A sound came into my head just then, like the ringing of a bell. I shall be hearing voices, Nick, like Joan of Arc. I miss the sound of bells here. My first memories of childhood were the bell that rang in the village round home. Sometimes when I was walking with my courtiers at saint Cloud, and they thought I was planning new campaigns, I was just allowing the sound of a bell to take me back to Corsica. All those early days and peaceful dreams. I'd uh, like to write a history of Corsica. Someday I write a history of. Sir, I wanted to ask. Better. He's fallen asleep. Perhaps we should wake him. No, no. Let him rest. I do not think he sleeps at night. 
Let him rest while he can. The garden was abandoned after a while because the emperor was confined more and more to his bed with some sickness that seemed to be growing inside him. One Sunday evening in 1821, he was in his room. Bertrand was attending him. Sir, Vignale is outside. Will you see him? For a moment only, then I want to see Montelon. Will you come in, Father? Good evening, Your Majesty. Is Your Majesty better? Yes, Vignale, yes. I, I shall have a word with you later. I'll send for you. Uh, does your... Uh, uh, does, does your majesty know that a comet was seen in the sky early this morning? A what? A c- c- comet. A comet? Uh, they, they say it's a happy omen, sir. Do they? I'm sorry that I missed it, Vignali. It, it, it may be visible again tonight, sir. Good, then I may see it after all. Thank you, Vignali. You go now. I, I, I'll send for you later. I, I want to speak to Montreal. Send him to me. Yes, Your Majesty. Uh, he's so devoted, it's difficult not to hurt his feelings. Bertrand, have you heard anything about this comet? I didn't see it, sir, but several of the others did. The comet was seen in the sky when Caesar died. When I, when I was a young man, I used to think, I'll flash like a meteor across the sky... And only my passage will be remembered. Oh, oh, oh this, this pain will... Will your majesty try some of this lemonade? Yes, yes. Uh, here you are, sir. It, it, it's got a strange smell. Are you conspiring with that beast, Antamarchy, again to make me swallow his poison? Because if you are, I'll slice a lot of you. Every mouthful of that stuff of his has given me a... hours of suffering. I... I haven't got much further to go now, Bertrand. Oh, sir. Oh, my son, if there were only more like you. What time is it? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Have the books arrived? They ought to be here, sir. I, I, I'll attend to it. Your Majesty? Oh, come in, Montalon. Come in. I would like to add a paragraph to the will. Yes, sir. Uh, there's some paper there on the desk. When you're ready, sir. I want to add to the fourth codicil, item five. Uh, have you got it there? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Good. My son should not think of avenging my death. He should profit by it. The aim of all his efforts should be to reign by peace. To do my work all over again would be to suppose that I had done nothing. I was obliged to daunt Europe by arms. The way to convince her today is by reason. It is my wish that he will study history well and ponder on it, for there alone he will learn the true philosophy. Have, 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 have you got... All that. Yes, sir. What paragraph follows? It is, my, it is my wish that my ashes repose on the banks of the Seine in the midst of the French people I have loved so well. Yes. And now, after paragraph 47, insert... I demand that a post-mortem should be made after my death. I, uh, 
I think the billiard room is the best place for the post-mortem. They can make use of the table. There's plenty of room in its light in there. Sir, you talk as though your career lay 300 years behind you. How can we tell what will happen? You're better today than you were yesterday. No man can escape his fate, Monolo. It's written in the stars that I am to die here. Well, perhaps it's just as well. In America, I should have been assassinated. It's a free country, or, or worse still, I might have been forgotten. No, 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 no. This martyrdom may save my dynasty. Have those books arrived yet? Yes, I brought them with me, sir. I think you'll be pleased. The, the Hannibal was amongst them. Oh, we've been crying for that book for the last six months. Have you heard about the comet, Montalon? Yes, sir, but they say it wasn't a comet. It was a meteor. Who said that? Well, the Admiral, sir, and the people at the observatory. Oh, well, we shall have to die without a comet. Your Majesty. Montalon, put my uh, feet up. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I'm tired. I've always despised my bed, yet now I would not exchange it for a throne. Sit down, Mandel. Thank you, sir. What time is it? Ten past six, sir. Have you got that book on the wars of Hannibal? Right here, sir. War is a simple art, you know, Montalon. Like everything beautiful. I used to argue with myself for hours concerning the plan of a battle, magnifying every incident, every danger. When I appeared the most calm, I was vibrating with the greatest excitement, like a, a girl about to have a, a baby. <sighs> Taking it all in all. What a ballad my life has been. Montano, read to me from the Hannibal. <clears throat> the wars of Hannibal occupy a page in history that has no counterpart in antiquity. Hannibal was educated by his father in the art of war. A father to whom hatred of the Romans was a sacred tradition. You have just heard the best plays production of St. Helena, starring Dennis King. And here once more is your host, drama critic John Chapman. I think this is a brilliant and fascinating play, and I wish we had more like it, more biographies than on the Broadway stage today. The gaps are too long between an Abraham Lincoln, a Pasteur, a Victoria Regina, and a magnificent Yankee. Our thanks to Dennis King and his fellow players for bringing St. Helena to us. Next week, our best play will be Tennessee Williams' Summer and Smoke, a drama with an interesting history. It was a comparative failure on Broadway and later an enormous success in an arena theater in Greenwich Village, thanks largely to the playing of an unknown young actress, Geraldine Page. Miss Page will be with us in Summer and Smoke next week. This is Chapman saying goodbye until then. St. Helena was transcribed and adapted for radio by Earl Hamner. Heard in the cast were Alexander Scorby as Montalon, Horace Bram as Bertrand, Philip Bournoff as Gorgo, Guy Spall as Las Casas, Ralph Bell as Dr. Antomarchi, Lester Fletcher as the Abbey, Guy Rep as Cipriani, June Peel as Countess Montalon, John Stanley as Sir Hudson Lowe, Ronald Long as Sir George Coburn, Ivor Francis as Captain Nichols, and Edwin Jerome as Dr. O'Mara. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King. Your announcer is Fred Collins. Listen to The Theatre Guild Sundays on NBC.